Answering B-Socratic Questions and the Construction of Scientific Arguments A scientific argument is based on data and a series of logical inferences to arrive at testable predictions. What data is relevant to a particular problem is not always clear, and what data is available is often incomplete, noisy, sometimes wrong, or turns out to be irrelevant. Because they are essentially always incomplete, the data, whatever they are, do not uniquely define a single logical argument. Multiple alternative interpretations of the meaning of the data are imaginable. To decide between alternative arguments, we need to be able to evaluate their scientific usefulness. To be evaluated, hypotheses must make explicit and measurable predictions. If a prediction is fulfilled, the hypothesis gains support. Of course, new data, or new, more accurate ways of measuring data, can end up revealing that a hypothesis is wrong or incomplete. Because of this, scientific arguments change over time, sometimes incrementally and sometimes dramatically. Science evolves. There are three main components to a scientific argument the claim, what it is you're trying to explain, the data, the evidence used to support the claim, and your reasoning, the logical inferences that relate the data to the claim. A student, Becky, is asked to explain why a plant's leaves are green. Below is her response. A plant's leaves are green because they contain chlorophyll. Chlorophyll is a natural pigment that absorbs all wavelengths in the visible spectrum, except green. The reflected green light is the color our eyes see. Try to identify the claim, data, and reasoning used. This example is adapted from Melanie Cooper. Becky's claim, the observation she seeks to explain, is that a plant's leaves are green, or rather appear green to us. Becky's data is that the leaves contain chlorophyll and that chlorophyll absorbs all wavelengths in the visible spectrum except green, that is, all the light humans can perceive. Becky's reasoning is that the presence of chlorophyll and its physical properties, that is, the wavelengths of light that it absorbs, and not some other factors such as innate greenness are what leads the plant leaves to reflect wavelengths of light that we perceive as green. Here's another example. A student, Alphonse, is asked to describe how, if spontaneous generation had occurred within the last 10 million years, it would change the circular tree of life. Here is the exact question. If spontaneous generation had occurred during the last 10 million years or so, how would that change the circular map of life? A. No change, same as before. B. Dramatically, and would indicate that the theory of evolution is incorrect. C. Some organisms would be unconnected to others. And D. All organisms would be unconnected to each other. The correct answer is C. Some organisms would be unconnected to others if spontaneous generation occurred sporadically. The three other choices, A, B, and D, are all quite popular, with C and B being the most common. Now, Alfonso is asked to explain why one of the wrong answers is wrong. Let us consider choice B. What might his claim, data, and reasoning be? What could they look like? His claim would be that the occurrence of spontaneous generation would not invalidate the theory of evolution. His data would be that evolutionary theory is not about the origin of life, but what happens to organisms or populations of entities with specific properties. His reasoning would be if new organisms appeared via spontaneous generation, and if those organisms produced a population with genetic variation and the ability to reproduce, 
that organism's descendants would evolve. They would form their own independent trees of life. Now, when you're working through a B-Socratic question and you're asked to explain why a wrong answer is wrong, be careful and think about what your claim is, what your data that you're using to support that claim, and how you argue from data to conclusion.